We are looking at the hydrohalogenation reaction, which is a reaction where we are doing addition to an alkene, specifically adding HCl, HBr, or HI to the alkene. And now we are ready to talk about the third variable that we need to keep in mind during the hydrohalogenation reaction, which is the potential for rearrangement of the carbocation intermediate that is formed in the reaction. So we are going to look at an example of an alkene addition that involves rearrangement. And this is also going to give us an opportunity to practice Markovnikov's rule um, as well as stereochemistry for this reaction. So let's use HI this time as our alkene, or excuse me, as our uh, reagent for the addition reaction. In, in the addition reaction, the double bond, electrons in the double bond reach out and grab the hydrogen of the H, HI, HBr, or HCl molecule, which causes that hydrogen halogen bond to break. And the electrons from the double bond are used to form a new bond to that hydrogen from the HI. The double bond is converted to a single bond, and the bond to the new hydrogen is either to um, either one of the carbon atoms of the alkene. So the first thing we have to figure out is where does that new hydrogen go? Which carbon of the alkene does it go to? To determine the location of the hydrogen, we use Markovnikov's rule. Markovnikov's rule asks us to figure out how many hydrogen atoms are on each carbon of the alkene. To determine which carbon has the most hydrogens, that's this one right here, it has two, the new hydrogen will add itself to that same position. So our new hydrogen is going to go right here. Now, even though we're using a line structure, I'm going to go ahead and draw those hydrogens in just for clarity. Draw them in over here as well. The other carbon, which is not getting the hydrogen, does get a positive charge on it. So this is our carbocation. Now at this point in the mechanism, before we continue, we need to ask ourselves, how good is this carbocation? And can we do a rearrangement to increase the stability of that carbocation? This particular carbocation is a carbon that is bonded to two other carbons, which makes it a secondary carbocation, which is pretty good. But if we could rearrange it to form a tertiary, that would be ideal. Remember when we're doing rearrangements, we can only move that positive charge to an adjacent carbon, so we could put it over here, or we could put the positive charge over here. If we were to put the positive charge right here, that would be a primary carbocation, which is not good. But if we put the positive charge here, that would be a tertiary carbocation, which is good. So that is what we want to do. There's a hydrogen atom on that carbon that we can shift to change the location of that positive charge. That's going to give us this molecule right here with the positive charge on a tertiary carbon, which gives us a tertiary carbocation, which is good. So the other product of this, or excuse me, the uh, after the carbocation is formed, the other thing that's formed at the same time is the iodide ion. And that iodide ion attacks the positively charged carbon and gives us the product, which is this uh, molecule right here. The last thing that we always need to do is analyze, did we make a chiral carbon in this process? Is this carbon chiral? It is not due to the symmetry of the cyclic portion of the molecule. This is an achiral carbon, so we don't have to worry about R versus S. Now, something that is unique about the carbocation rearrangement with the hydrohalogenation reaction is that we do not see 100% rearrangement. In other reactions that we've looked at where there has been carbocation rearrangement, we've seen a 100% rearrangement to the more stable um, carbocation. But this reaction is so favorable that some of our secondary carbocations are actually going to be reacted with before they have an opportunity to rearrange. 
So we will also see, I'm gonna use a different color for this arrow, we will also see some situations where the iodide in this case is actually, I made my curved arrow go to the wrong carbon. The iodide is actually attacking before the molecule has a chance to undergo rearrangement. And that would give us this product right here. Now you're probably assuming, correctly assuming, that the major product is coming from the most stable carbocation, and that is definitely the, the accurate, um, so that's accurate. The minor product is coming from the carbocation that is less stable, that has not been rearranged. But we do see the formation of both of these products, so it's important that you list both of them. Now, last but not least, with the formation of this minor product, no notice that this carbon is chiral. We did make a chiral carbon right here. And there um, is a couple of ways that we can communicate the chirality of this carbon. So one way is that we could actually draw both of the stereoisomers that are formed from this reaction just simply by putting one of the iodides on a wedge and one on a dash. Another thing that we could do to express the formation of these stereoisomers is that we could draw with line notation and then underneath it, so we're not using any wedges or dashes, write enantiomers, which is a chemist's way of saying that we are forming both enantiomers of this particular molecule. Another way that we could express it would be to draw one, either one of the stereoisomers, I'll draw the one with the wedge, and then underneath it write and enantiomer or plus enantiomer, which is saying that we are making this molecule as well as its enantiomer. And so any one of those versions, you could draw them both. You could draw this and indicate that you're making both enantiomers, or you could draw one and say that you are making its enantiomer. Whatever your instructor prefers is what you should go with. And for me personally, as an instructor, I'm happy with any one of these, these different methods. So to summarize, this particular reaction forms three products. This is our major product, and these two are minor products.